Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, January the 19th, 2022. It is currently 3.51 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church located right here in Ovalo, Texas. And it is time once again. Now, even though I'm in the middle of nowhere, Texas, we are going to take our spotlight. Now, I know we're we're far from everyone else, but because of technology, I'm going to use this technology to, in a figurative way, turn a spotlight and focus it in on another Christian podcast that I want you to check out, I want you to consider subscribing to, and I want you to consider listening to on a regular and consistent basis. Now, at the end of 2021, I started asking people, hey, send me your list of the podcasts you listen to. Send me a list and we'll compile a list of all the podcasts that I think people should subscribe to. We'll make like a a list of the top 10. Well, not, not everyone participated in that activity. Just a few people sent me their list. I'm appreciative of those lists because, well, it gave me things to listen to, but it really wasn't like, I was hoping for like maybe a hundred different lists and then I could go through and just really, it would be, you know, I would have a lot to pull from, but it was only a few lists. But I'm very appreciative of those, and I and and some of those may show up in what we're going to do. So what I decided, so I made a decision. I originally was just going to make a, compile a list, and then just say, "Hey, everyone, here's the list. Number one is, or number ten is, number nine, number eight, number seven, and number one is, and then give everyone like the number one that the one that showed up on the most list, and and kind of do it like a countdown, and then everybody would go subscribe to it, and then I would post a list." Um, at the theologycentral.net pod page and the blog section. But I made a decision, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Here's what I'll do. Just every once in a while, I'll turn on the microphone and I'll just turn on the spotlight by previewing and and reviewing uh, different Christian podcasts that I think you should check out and think you should listen to. The goal here is to get you to go subscribe to these podcasts, to get you to check them out because we have so much available to us. One of the crazy things about, I mean, one of the amazing things I should say first is that we have so much available to us. We have so much Bible teaching, theology. It's like a seminary. You can get a seminary education every day and all you really need is a Bible, a notebook and a, a, a you know, a phone or a tablet and you just subscribe to a Christian podcast and to sermons, you really can almost structure it where you're like, okay, here's theology. Here's, you know, uh, here's a Bible study. Here's, uh, you know, you, you can break it down into different areas of theology. I mean, literally you can kind of create your own curriculum, your own course of study just using sermons and Christian podcasts. It is absolutely amazing what is available to you. What's frustrating is all of that is available, and yet every time another study comes out, Christians are more theologically illiterate than they've ever been. Christians are more biblically illiterate than they've ever been. And it's like, okay, it's not because you don't have access to things. It's because you're not using what's available to you, and you're using the technology you do have simply to entertain yourself. Just, I don't know what you do with it. Whatever you do, I mean, only you know what you do with your phone. Only you know what you do with your laptop or your tablet. Only you know. And so I'm not going to make a judgment, but I know this. If you're not using it for Christian podcasts, sermons, theology, church history, doctrine, then I hope I I can offer a not so gentle rebuke and say, put your phone down if you're not going to use it for something of value fix it. So we've tried to do a couple of things this year uh, and really starting last year to really hope to get, we've tried to do some things so that you can get the most out of the technology that you have available to you. We have the Bible memory app to help you memorize scripture, one scripture each week. That's easy to do. And and the Bible memory app gives you like a three-step process and it gives you uh, notifications to tell you it's time to do your review. So that's that's great. We have that. We have the Bible study curriculum, which you can access via your phone or tablet. That's 
That's free to you. All you have to do is email me, newsif at yahoo.com, and say, I want the curriculum. If you want the Bible Memory app, you just go to the app store of your choice, look for Bible Memory app. Once you have it downloaded, look for, uh, go to, I think, groups, say see all, and then do a search for Theology Central, and join the group absolutely free. Right, and then you'll get you'll get notified whenever I you'll you'll just see the the, the verses are right there for you to start memorizing. Very simple, very easy. Um, and another thing is you have obviously access to podcast. So what we want to do is point you to those podcasts that we think you should listen to. Now, so far I've given you three, and our and our first spotlight episode I gave you three: five minutes in church history, the Christian history almanac, and simply put. You can listen to all, if uh, these are not, these three are not even released on a daily basis, but even if they were were released on a daily basis, that would take you about 15 to 20 minutes to listen to all three. And there you would get church history and you would get theology. There you go. That, that's, that's not much of a time commitment. You can fit in that. And since they're not even daily, well, a Christian history al- almanac is, that's daily, but uh, five minutes in church history and simply put are not necessarily a daily podcast. So you can easily fit those in while you're commuting to work, while you're, while you're eating breakfast. I mean, there's so many different ways. So please subscribe to five minutes in church history, uh, the Christian history almanac, and simply put. Now, I subscribe to all three via the Edify Christian Podcast app. I'm really pushing that, the Edify Christian Podcast app, just because all the Christian podcasts are right there. But you can get those three pretty much anywhere you get your podcast. And what, remember, wherever you get your podcast, also consider subscribing to this podcast, Theology Central. We would greatly appreciate that as well. But it's time again to turn our spotlight on another podcast. Now, we've, we've done church history. We've done theology. How about hermeneutics? Let's do a podcast that, that kind of focuses on hermeneutics. On, yeah, let's just, let's do that. I, I'm not going to go into any more because I'm going to play the, the most recent episode. In fact, I got the notification just the other day on the Edify Christian Podcast app. And I was like, oh, this looks interesting. I started listening to it. And I'm like, stop, stop, stop. Don't do that. I'll listen to it together with everyone else as we turn the spotlight on this podcast and, and, and hopefully we can get people to subscribe to it, listen to it, and use it, and maybe have discussions about it. Now, of course, if you are, a, and another thing, another thing that we're doing, I've almost forgot, we have the Bible Memory app that helps you memorize scripture. We have the Bible study curriculum that helps you study. And then we have the Discord Theology Central discussion group where we have discussions and we talk about theology, doctrine, all, all kinds of interesting things. There's there's conversations going on right now in the Discord channel. Um, so you can be a part of that as well. If you want to be a part of that, download the Discord um, app. Yeah, I think you can just do a search for Theology Central. You should be able to find us. If you, well, actually, I think the only way you can find it is if I send you a link. You have to email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and I will send you a link, and you can be a part of the Discord channel. Now, if you're just going to be there to argue and to debate, we don't want that. We want it to be a, just a fun, relaxed place where we can have conversation, ask questions, and discussions about things uh, that are very important. So far, it's been a, really a positive thing, and we want to keep it that way. So if you dislike me and you just want to argue with me, then just email me and not mess up the whole Discord channel because that's good. That's kind of why we have it kind of blocked where I can kind of control who comes in and you have to come in through invitation. So email me, let me know that you want to be a part of it and why you want to be a part of it. And then I can send you a uh, invitation. All right, so that's just another thing that, that to use your technology for something beneficial. But now... Okay, so those are all the things we've offered. And as I've said, I'm going to give you another Christian podcast here for you to consider listening to. This one deals more with hermeneutics. I think it's very important. Okay, Uh, Twyla, who's a part of the Discord uh, group, said, I found it by searching. I didn't have to have the link. Okay, that's good. So you can join even even without a link. You can join and then, uh, well... If there's a problem, then we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about the problem. We'll talk about if we have any problems. So far, it's not been any problems. All right. But here we go. We're going to turn to this podcast. I'm not even going to tell you the name. I think you're going to be find it interesting. Another short one. I'm trying to find you short ones. This one runs about 
15 minutes max, I think. Maybe some go a little longer. I think most are shorter than 15 minutes, and they deal basically with hermeneutics. This one's easy to, uh, I think, I think you shouldn't have a problem finding this one. Again, I subscribe to it using the Edify Christian Podcast app. Um, while this is airing, I'll start, ch- uh, I'll check the other uh, podcast apps because I use them all. <laughs> I have a Pocket Cast, Breaker. I've got them all. So I'll just start uh, Player FM, Radio Republic. I got them all right here on this on this um, iPad. I'll just start going through all of them and searching. And uh, okay, I'll, uh, so yeah, if, if if you find Theology Central in the Discord channel, uh, just to take a detour, and you can't join then you may have to send me uh, an email and then I can send you an invitation. You may be able to find it, but you may not be able to join it. So just for clarification, if that occurs. All right, everybody ready? Here we go. Let's just jump in. Here we go. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast to the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Joining me today on Exegetically Speaking is Dr. John Lonsma. He's the Gerald F. Hawthorne Professor of New Testament Greek and Exegesis here at Wheaton College. He's also Department Chair of Modern and Classical Languages. It's good to see you, my friend. Uh, it's so good to see you back on Wheaton's campus. Oh, listen, it's just been great. And it's a nice uh, season to visit the Midwest. Okay, now we gotta. I just got to jump in. The podcast is called Exegetically Speaking. I just did a search for it on the Breaker podcasting app, popped right up, exegetically speaking. So I can, you can follow it there. Um, it's on the Edify Christian podcast app. In fact, let me see how easy it is to find on the Edify Christian podcast app. Um, it should be relatively easy. Their search uh, function maybe is not as good as uh, other other apps are. Okay, hang on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it showed. Yeah, it showed up really quick. Okay. Yeah, I found it super easy. Okay, Twyla saying she found it on uh, Edify super easy. I found it easy. Um, I didn't even get the whole word typed out, and it showed up immediately. Exegetically speaking, uh, ex- exegetically speaking is a weekly podcast of the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Illinois, and the Lanier Theology Library hosted by Dr. David Capes and former dean. And it goes with just basically what he's already said. And uh, well, this episode is going to be about the words. I'm dropping my iPad. The words uh, and the transformation, uh, Matthew 17, 1 through 9. Matthew 17, 1 through 9. They're going to talk about the words used in this chapter Uh, in regards to the transfiguration, I think what they're going to try to do here is kind of give us an idea how to do maybe a typical word study. I think that's where they're going to go with this, but we will see. So let's jump back in. Oh, it is. I mean, the fall. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the weather here in the fall is fantastic. I love the fall. I mean, except for a few months out of the year, Mm -hmm. it just gets a little bitter cold. But Mm -hmm. Well, we're months away from something like that, I hope. Today, we're going to talk about word studies. A lot of people, when they think about Bible study, they think about studying a word. Yep. And we're going to look at the transfiguration as kind of a model for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what are we looking at? Well, we will use the transfiguration, and, and you're exactly right that uh, I think for most of us who listen, whether online or just listen to preaching, we can get the sense that the essence of exegesis is words and examining words, or at least it's a panacea of all exegetical woes. And words are very important, but it's also important to make some distinctions in how we think about how words work and, and how to study them. So that's that's what we want to talk about. And you know, first, just three simple kinds of uh, distinctions. If, if your job is to write a dictionary, then of course, your whole job is to break words apart from each other and isolate a word and come up with its meaning or meanings. But if you're an exegete, if you're reading a text, 
Now, it's important to understand that the, the meaning is less in the words than it is in the sentences and paragraphs. Oh, that is so good. That is so good. That is so good. All right. If you're writing a dictionary, it's about the, it's about the meaning of the word. All right. Here's what this word means, period. In exegesis or in Bible study, it's not just what the word means. It's how, how, what the word means in light of the sentence, the verse, the paragraph, the chapter in which it's used, right? Sometimes people will do, well, see, the word means this. So like, I, I've had, oh, oh, sometimes it drives me crazy. You'll be studying a, a text of scripture and be able to, well, the word means this, the word means this, the word means, what does that word mean? And you're like, slow down, calm, everyone take a deep breath, okay? How about, wait, so where is this word found? What's, what's going on in the verse? What's going on in the chapter? And sometimes I think people think that I'm being dismissive. It's not that I'm trying to be dismissive, like, that's how it works in exegesis. It's like, okay, yes, that's what the word means, but we, what does it mean in, in the context of the, of the verse that it is found, in the chapter that it's found? We've, it's less sometimes about the actual definition of a word. Sometimes it is. Like, you can't ignore the definition of the word, but it can't just be like, well, that word means this. End of story. Boom. You're wrong. It's like, uh, how about you take a deep breath? Okay, calm down. And like, wait a minute. So where is that verse found? Okay, what's going on there? Okay, wait, we've got to ask a lot of other questions. It's just not like, oh, let me stop. Let me look up a, a, a you know, a Strong's definition. Boom, I've, I've, I've done exegesis. It's like, no, you found the definition. Now we got to take that definition and uh, see how that fits in with the words that are found around it. The context, the there's so much more to it. So, man, that's right right there. See, that's why you should subscribe to that podcast. See, we've listened to a podcast that's, easy, that's free to you on any device that you have. We're two minutes and 27 seconds into it. Any Christian can access it. And it just gave you a very basic, simple rule of exegesis. See, that's, it's just mind-blowing to me. Like, there was a time in your life that you probably would never even learn that rule um, oh, I can't, um, Twyla saying, can I turn the volume up in the podcast? No, I've got it up to 100. I, I don't understand. This is the problem I have with so many Christian podcasts. For some reason, they, they record them all like this, like this. Hey, we don't want to talk too loud. Okay, I, I don't understand. But no, I, I've got it cranked to 100. So I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, I just want you to just realize that there was a time that if you wanted to learn principles like that, you, you had to go, go to a library and find a book on hermeneutics, or you had to go buy a book. Um, in many cases, you wouldn't learn anything like this in church. And now the average layper, or you had to go off to Bible college or seminary. Now just the average person sitting in their house can learn principles of exegesis for free. It's mind-blowing to me. Like Christians in 2022 should be the smartest Christians that's ever lived on the planet. It's just mind-blowing to me what we have available to us. Every, every time I'm just blown away. All right, here we go. And sentences and paragraphs are kind of like a puree of grammar and vocabulary and other elements. And it's almost counter nature to try to break that apart into its bits as if there's, you know, it's a, as if it's pixelated or something, as if the meaning <laughs> is in the little bits. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you want to understand what it is you're doing as an exegete and where the meaning is. Secondly, you know, another kind of broad distinction is just understanding how communication happens, what's happening right now between you and me in this room. You know, words, we can think of words almost like a conveyor belt from my mind to your mind. <laughs> uh, it's like a great a, image, yeah. At a gravel pit taking buckets of discrete bits of meaning to you. Whereas in actual fact in communication, if we think about it, it's a collaborative process in terms of generating meaning. Words function, except maybe in poetry, but in everyday conversation, words are triggers, they're gestures. I'm kind of tossing words your direction. I'm depending on your ability to unpack those words mm -hmm. and recognize implications and recognize necessary context. And so there's a lot more meaning going on than, and than is contained in any of those words. 
Okay. Now, uh, Twilight thinks that the volume may be loud enough, but she has a house full of, uh, have a house of six kids. So it may be too loud. All I can say is, hey, kids, listen up. Okay, I'm talking. <laughs> all right. No, okay. I, I don't think that's, I don't think it probably helped at all. Probably, probably, they're probably like, we don't care. <laughs> okay. All right. So, all right, back to this. Now, this is very important. So, number one, the meaning of words goes beyond just the definition of a word. It also involves the context in which they're found. Also, in communication, it when we're communicating, it goes beyond just maybe the meaning of the word. There's there's ideas. So when I'm reading, I'm, I'm like, what's the idea they're trying to convey here? What's the meaning? It's just not the meaning of the words. So th- this is why communication breaks down amongst people so many times. I may say something, and I'm in many cases, I am assuming that you can understand what I'm trying to imply, that you can understand what I'm trying to get across, that you can understand that I'm asking a question because I'm trying to help you figure it out. And, but if, if you don't understand all of those other things that I'm trying to do in my communication, communication breaks down. I think a lot of people, when they open their Bibles, they just see words and they just, I don't know, they just lose their minds. And it's like, calm down here. They're that writer under their inspiration of the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate something. So we have to step back and go, okay, so what are they trying to communicate? Not just the meaning of the word. What are they trying to communicate to me? What, what are they trying to tell me? I've got, there's, there's, there's more than just the actual meaning of the word, right? So these are all very important concepts. Vigilant. I think you had Gene Green on an earlier episode to talk about this at, at more length. Yeah, yeah he Technical did. Technical phrases, relevance theory, but it's it can be made sort of common sense. So we need to understand that. And then also as we approach the task of word studies, it's really important to make a distinction between theme studies or idea studies, using those interchangeably, and word studies. And very often when we think we're after the meaning of a word, what Really, if we thought about it, what we're really after is an idea or a theme, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. love or peace or something else. And that's really not disconnected from everything else. It's not just a single word. It's, it's not right. It's connected to other things in the text itself. So there may be words that convey that idea, but you're going to want to look at a range of synonyms, even antonyms, passages that don't even use the words to get at that idea or theme. So if you get through all that and you boil it down, you say, but yeah, but I do want to study words, there are still going to be distinctions that require you to step back and ask, what is the question you're really asking of the text? What is it Mm -hmm. you really want to know as an exegete, not as an author of a dictionary, but an exegete? So that's where the transfiguration becomes kind of handy as an illustration, and I'm not going to give an exhaustive list, but you know, four possible kinds of questions that you can ask revolving around words. So, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this, and there's they're overlapping accounts, and they're similar in some ways, different in other mm-hmm. ways. One of the points where they differ is in their attempt to to paint, as it were, a verbal picture of what Jesus looked like. Uh, when he started to change. And they all use slightly different vocabulary at that point. Matthew says he alimpsed, using the verb lampo. Where we get the word lamp from. Yeah, yes. right. Which means to emit rays of light or to shine. Right. Now, the point is we don't have any other access to this thing, this reality. All we have are these verbal uh, descriptions. And so all we can do is take those words and try to get a sense of what they mean, the sense of the words, of lampo in this case. And we would do that by looking at various contexts where that verb is used, inferring its use in these different contexts. We would look at synonyms, antonyms. We'd put it on the larger map of the language. It's a measure of how this word's meaning is distinguished from other words that could have been used, the sense of the word. That's probably what most of us are thinking we're doing in all word studies, but that's just you know one kind of question to ask because if you go on in the description... Okay, if now because this podcast is so short, see, if, if I was doing what they were doing, it would be like eight months of podcast and... You could say that's why I'm not good at this because I do go I, – I, I can't seem to make everything short. So like 
they, they just went through that. They didn't even stop to have you look it up. So if you, if you want to know where the Greek word that they're referring to appears, I, I, can, I can explain it to you. So Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Now, that, another reason sometimes, now, sometimes I like the short podcast, which I wish I could do, but I can't. But I like listening to them for this reason, because they don't do all the work. <laughs> so then I like to go, oh, thank you. Now, I, I've got something I can go work on. So I'll listen, and then I, then I put my phone down or my iPad, and then I start, well, working on it for the next three hours. So we could do a lot of work on this, but let me just show you what they're referring to. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain, and was transfigured before them. Now, transfigured is not the word, I think they called it, I think they referred to it as lampo. It's not lampo. So it's not the transfigured part. And his face did shine. His face did shine. Now, here is where, okay, it's trying to communicate in some way what 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 he looked like. His face did shine. Well, that Greek word did shine, the, the Greek phrase here is, and I'll put, and I'll, uh, is the word lampo, and it's used how many times? Seven times. Um, it means to beam, to radiate brilliancy, literally or figuratively, figuratively give light or shine. All right. That's so. In other words, here it, the the text is trying to convey in some ways, kind of what did they see? What did they look like? Now you could ask. Now this would be a question I would ask in doing exegesis. Is the primary purpose of this text to give us a clear description of what he looked like? Or is that just secondary to the purpose of the text? Like, is the primary purpose of the text, hey, do you want to know what Jesus looked like when he was transfigured? Well, go to Matthew 17. I don't know if that, I don't think that's the primary purpose. So, yeah, okay, Lampo, great. I don't know how much emphasis I would put on that in doing exegesis. And some people would get caught up on something like this. And that's where then I, if you like, well, what did Jesus look like? And I may go, well, wait a minute. So what, what's really going on in Matthew 17? Now you may think I'm disregarding you, but what I'm trying to get you to do is see what's the actual purpose of Matthew 17? What is it actually trying to convey? And I don't know if it's actually trying to give us a description of what he looked like, but it is interesting that that's how he is described here. And you can look at all the other accounts and see they use slightly different words. You put them all together, maybe you'll get some idea of what Jesus looked like. Is that really the, the point? That, that's the question I would ask. All right, here we go. At least in Matthew's account, it said he was metamorpho. That's the mm-hmm. verb that's used, mm-hmm. metamorpho. That's, that's the word from which we get transfigured. He was transformed. Now, you can do the same thing with that word. You look it up in all those texts, study synonyms, antonyms. When it's all done, you're going to end up saying the sense of the word is it indicates a change in appearance or possibly an internal change of nature. And that's, that's good. That's helpful. But as an exegete, you're probably going to say, that doesn't really scratch my itch. Because what I want to know is what happened up there. And I'm studying the word metamorpho to figure out, what is it that happened? What was this reality? And knowing the word's meaning or sense doesn't get us very far. So then you're probably going to want to take further steps where you look at the context, try to infer what they thought the significance of this was as they narrated this. Some of those clues point in the direction of the resurrection. So what you might do then is slide over to the resurrection narratives or First Corinthians 15, which don't use the verb metamorpho, but they do give other perspectives on the thing being talked about, which is what you're probably really after when you're looking at that word, if you notice the distinction. So that's two. Thirdly, even before that, it says they went up on a high aras, a mountain. Okay, well, if you look that up, if you get the sense of the word, it means high hill, a mountain, higher than a bunas, which is a lower elevation hill. Well, big whoopee ding dong. I mean, what, that, it's always a mountain. You know, what does that really tell you about what it is? And we don't know the referent. We don't know the real mountain. No, we don't know where this took place. If you go to Israel, they might say, well, here's the mountain of transfiguration. That one or that one. Yeah, we don't know the referent. But Again, if you read the context, the clues are all over the place that we're to be thinking not just of that aras, but of other arases from 
Jewish history, especially Mount Sinai, where there is a lot of verbal overlap between the transfiguration narrative and things said about Moses on, on Mount Sinai, or even Mount Zion, or, or just the holy mountain idea out of the Old Testament and ancient Near East. So it's clear the significance of that word for an exegete is not so much its meaning or its referent, but its larger associations and connotations, you know, and that's really what we're after. So that's third. But then fourth, these words were out of Matthew, but if we slide over to Luke, Luke alone tells us that it was while Jesus was praying, and the verb is prosukamai, common verb for praying, that he changed in his appearance. Well, again, we can study the sense of it. It means to entreat God in some way, but that doesn't get us very far. We don't know the referent because we don't know the content of the prayer. Maybe to some extent these associations or connotations that we saw with Metamorpho are in view. But really the significant thing here is that it is Luke alone who adds that detail to the transfiguration. And it's also Luke alone that way back in the baptism of Jesus adds the detail that it was while Jesus was praying that the dove descended on him and so forth. Right. And the baptism is almost secondary, isn't it? It's the descent of the Spirit. Exactly. Jesus yeah. is baptized, but right. it's with a word or two that's said. Right. But it's this other sort of experience that he has while praying of the Spirit. Exactly. Of the voice yeah. that he hears from heaven. So now the word prosukamai is probably of interest to us as an exegete. Again, not so much for its meaning, not so much for its referent, possibly for some of the associations, but particularly because it signals a what technical exegetes call redactional theme, a, a special interest of Luke in telling the story of Jesus where he highlights the prayers of Jesus. Jesus and the prayers of the community. Yeah. That's, That's what he wants us to pick up on there. Yeah. Well, this is fascinating. This is a great way of thinking about these particular words. Well, it's fun stuff. But it really is. As you were talking, I was thinking about how in other places in Matthew's gospel, mountains continue to figure. You have the Sermon on the yeah. Mount, right? You have the Mount of Transfiguration. And then the gospel ends with That's Jesus fun. and his disciples on a mm-hmm. mountain. Mm-hmm. So you have to think about, well, what, what did mountains do? What did mm-hmm. they stand for in those days? Mm-hmm. Why mm-hmm. Why were temples built on mountains, right? Right, exactly. And what is the what is our sort of existential experience when we're on a mountain? Yeah, and so we now you're see off these and running. Vistas. Yeah, I mean, you go all yeah. kinds of different yep. places. With yep. Them. yep. And we think all we want to know is Aras means high hill. That's what we think of. <laughs> yeah. But no, no, no. no, no we that's... have all these other questions. That's and, just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Yeah, and part of the key is shining that light kind of inward on your mind to figure out what are the questions I'm really trying to ask of this text because they require different strategies of reading the text. Yeah. Now, I will interrupt here. They, they, they kind of take off, I mean, again, because it's short, they can't really give us a good lesson here, but I will, I will challenge this. Now, again, the goal here is just to turn the spotlight onto this podcast, and I want you to subscribe to it. It's called Exegetically Speaking. Go subscribe to it right now because it brings up all of these questions. And so I, I could take every one of these episodes and we could do a full study on this kind of thing. The, the most important thing when you're dealing with a text is the questions you ask the, te- the text. So, like, they're asking questions, oh, oh, okay, what's the significance of, er, I think, eras is the word, uh, mountains? Okay, well, I don't, I don't think that's a good question to ask the text. I, personally, I don't think. I think the question is, what is the significance of the transfiguration? What does it signify? What does it indicate? That, to me, is I don't need to go tracking down mountains as they're used throughout Matthew and go, well, there's some significance here about mountains. And then get in some theoretical discussion about the significance of mountains and my relationship to mountains when I'm on top of one. That, that to me is actually har- uh, harmful because it actually leads you away from the text. I need to stay in Matthew 17 and only leave Matthew 17 to gather information that helps me understand Matthew 17. That, that's cross-referencing. So here, it, it, those, those Greek words are interesting on saying, you know, transfigured, all right? There's the idea of a metamorphosis, all right? Uh, shine, there's lampo, okay? All right, that, that kind of gives me some description. Now, the point is, what is the significance of him being transfigured in front of this? Now, I did find it interesting they kind of went over to 
some some text that references the resurrection. Hmm, okay, now does that help me understand that? I think that I think they're I think they're so focused on trying to understand. So what happened here? What 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 what's going on? And they go to Luke while he was praying. Okay, that's got to be significant. I think that all misses the point. He's transfigured. What is the significance of the transfiguration? Not only to those who witness it, but to those of us who read about it. What does it indicate? Does the transfiguration reveal a reality that people may have been blinded to by simply seeing Jesus in the flesh? Does it reveal something about Jesus that the flesh itself, in a sense, covered or did not clearly reveal? Is is that the point? Is, 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 in other words, the flesh revealed the humanity of Christ, but the transfiguration revealed that Christ was more than just, he was truly man, but there was something else there as well, which then you could get into the hypostatic union, the Chalcedonian definition. We could get into that. Is that the point? So the question is, sometimes when you have a text like this, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, so what is the text trying to say is sometimes we bring our questions, right? Our questions are like, so what did Jesus look like? Okay. Okay. That's your question. Your question may be irrelevant to the text. What is the text trying to say? That's the question you have to figure out. What the question you should bring to every text, what is the text trying to indicate? What is we, we can bring our questions to the text, which may be fun and can make for a great evening of people sitting around having discussions about the text or in our Discord channel, people talking about a text. That's fun. There's nothing wrong with that. But at some point, someone has to say, time out. Let's set aside all of our speculation. Let's set aside all of our questions because the only question that really matters is what is the text trying to get across. I can read Shakespeare and bring all of my questions to Shakespeare, but what ultimately I need to figure out, what was Shakespeare trying to say in this part or in this part or in this paragraph? Or What was he trying to say? I can, I can watch a movie and bring all of my thoughts to it, but at, at the end of it, what was the director trying to say? What were the writers trying to get across? When I listen to a song, I can bring all of my thoughts to it. But what is the song? What is the song trying to convey? What is the message it's trying to convey? What is it trying to get across? I may disagree with the message, but I still want to understand it. So I love some of the points they give here. I love, but here I'm a little frustrated because they're just bringing the bringing. I do agree that you must bring questions to the text, but the question I bring to the text is, what is this text trying to convey? So I, all right, let's finish this up. Fascinating stuff. Dr. Mm-hmm. John Lonsma, thanks for being with us today. Oh, Always glad to be on Exegetically mm-hmm. Speaking. Thanks to Ian Rosine, Rebecca Larson, and Silvio Vasquez, who helped us produce this podcast. Thanks as well to John Lonsma, our Wheaton-based director, who makes this podcast possible. We're grateful to Phil Keggy. For our music. If you want to study biblical languages, then you need to consider Wheaton College. Whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, we have amazing programs, a first rate faculty, and some of the best students in the world. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for modern and classical languages. Get started today. If you have questions about this or any of our podcasts, we'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions or questions about any passage in the Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament, send us an email and we'll see if we can get one of our experts to weigh in on that for you. Our email is exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening. There you have it. A short podcast brought up some interesting points. Yes, there's a little, some, some, some differences I would have. I will just end with this because I want to make this, not only do I want you to know about the podcast, but I want to make this valuable to you. Remember, whenever you open your Bible, okay, I've got my Bible right here, and you start reading whatever text, your you question you want to have is what is this text trying to convey? What is it, what message is it trying to get across? 
That is the question you will always bring to it. Now, in some cases, it's a historical narrative. You're like, okay, it's trying to convey to me, for example, our Bible study exercise this week in Genesis 37. What is it trying to convey? Well, it's trying to convey, first and foremost, all the problems going on in that family. I mean, that family in Genesis 37, Jacob, Joseph, his brother, and you have multiple wives. I mean, you talk about a favoritism. Now you want to, we, we don't like our brother. We can't speak peaceably to him. Now we're going to plan to kill him. We're going to sell him into slavery. You got a dysfunctional family. Now, first and foremost, that text wants you to, con- it, it's conveying all of the issues within the family. Now, the broader context is going to show God working in, through, and above the dysfunction in that family. Yes. Now, what can I learn from that? Well, we've been using it as that family demonstrates the, that sometimes within family life, there can be lots of spiritual pitfalls. I mean, where does, where does Joseph end up there? Okay, well, well, we can have a discussion about that. So, but uh, you always bring that question first and foremost to the text. That, that I think that's just very important. Before you start, all those other questions, all those other things are perfectly good questions to have. Well, why? Okay, it mentions a mountain here. We don't really know the mountain. Now, wait a minute. Matthew mentions mountains multiple times. Is there a significance there? You can ask that question, but tr- let me make it very clear. Mountains is not the point of the trans. If, if you read, the, <laughs> let me state this. If you read Matthew 17 about the transfiguration, and you find yourself focusing on mountains and not the one being transfigured, you've missed the point. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that, I think that is a very good rule. So I know what they were trying to do. They were trying to show you that in the text, there's lots of interesting things with all of the different Greek words. That's great. But it's not just about showing you, hey, see all the different Greek words? There's a lot there to study. That's great, but at some point you want to make sure you you can constantly remind people of some basic principles so that they don't actually confuse themselves when studying the Bible. So I'm going to I'm going to step in and do what they should have done there. I understand why they didn't because they have a limited amount of time and you can tell that I've already gone 41 minutes. So obviously they weren't going to go as long as I did, but you you get the idea. All right, exegetically speaking, Put it on your list. If you listen to it for a while and you decide you don't like it, well, let me know. I, I, I mean that, honestly. If you're like, eh, I decided I didn't like it. Let me know why you didn't like it. Let me know. Um, and you say, well, see, that kind of bothered me because they didn't, they, they, they didn't give me, they didn't give me everything or, or they could have confused me. Look, you, you, you listen to things to be challenged to think, right? So you got to learn to, when someone gives you an exegetical idea, you got to stop and go, well, wait a minute. So is that a good idea? Bad idea? You have to, you have to test it. You have to see. So um, I think it's still worth your time. But uh, yeah, any of these that I suggest, if you listen to them and you decide you don't like them, let me know why. And then we can replace them with others. Uh, We can replace them with others, right? There you go. That's uh, part two in our Christian spotlight. That's exegetically speaking. Remember the ones I've given you so far, five minutes in church history, the Christian history almanac. Have you listened to it today? Simply put, a new episode of Simply Put dropped yesterday on biblical theology. What is biblical theology? Well, you should know now if you listen to that podcast. And now exegetically speaking, subscribe to all of them. Have you a good list? And if you have uh, if you have one, even if you don't have a list, if you have a couple that you listen to, just email them to me because I'll listen to them and then maybe I, I will uh, put the spotlight on one of those so that other people can benefit from it as well. All right. Email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. I don't want to, oh, now that got me all fired up about, about some exegetical uh, principles. Oh, that, that, now it makes me want to start a series on it, but I, I can't do that. I got too many other series to work on, but okay. Well, well we, we talk about a lot of exegetical and uh, uh, hermeneutical principles in our Bible study exercises. So um, well, well, trust me, before the year's out, we'll, we'll, we'll have an ability to, to maybe talk about some of the issues that they just brought up. All right, newsif at yahoo.com. I'll st- I'm going to stop for a few minutes. I'll be back on the air here shortly. All right, God bless.